Sala. August the 5th, 1978, and this is an interview with Carmen Lucian in the Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Okay, uh, what I want to do first is sort of talk about your childhood, okay? Yes. Let me ask you some questions about that. I know that your father was a union member. What do you think influenced him to join the Malamated Clothing Workers? Well, <laughs> first of all, he believed in unions, mm -hmm. which was the important thing. Secondly, he wanted to do what the rest of the Americans were doing, was to belong to, in other words, any, any uh, group of, of uh, foreigners that came in wanted to get oriented quickly mm -hmm. and assimilated in the American way of life. And he was very anxious to do what was right. And coming from Italy, he didn't know much about unions because uh, they, he worked in a, in the he, he worked in a hospital, no, he worked in a college. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole family worked in the college. One was in the infirmary, and one was a tailor. And my father was, who had so much wit, could do almost anything, could get any kind of a job <laughs> because he, you know, used to uh, laugh his way through it. Uh, he was uh, the one that took care of what, whether the children or the students showed up, whether they were in class, whether they responded to the call in the morning, whether their lights were out at night. I don't know what you sound title. like a dorm mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You sort of love Yeah. It. So that uh, there were at least three or four members of the family that already worked in the college. We were artisans. Actually, he was a, he was a cabinet maker, a very fine cabinet maker. But when they land in the United States, because of a lack of language, mm -hmm. uh, he, he couldn't uh, get in, into that kind of work. And it seemed that everybody was going, clothing workers were very important, very, very much needed. Yes. And uh, so he went in with the rest of them. So the whole family worked in the, in the clothing industry. Mm -hmm. So when there was a strike, we were all out of work. <laughs> nearly starving to death mm -hmm. and they'd keep us long enough so that um, we wouldn't we'd have to go back sooner or later we couldn't stay out anymore because of economic reasons mm -hmm. so we'd crawl back to work um, and until the next time <laughs> until the next time when you couldn't take it anymore mm -hmm. so well, did you ever have a chance to do anything else than, rather than go to work in the factory? Was that the only work open to you when you had to quit school and go to work? Well, <clears throat> you see, unfortunately, I um, I wasn't very bright. At least I was told I wasn't very oh. bright. Well, I kept, you know, uh, it, 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 some, some Italian people uh, have a habit of calling nicknames of the children uh -huh. that uh, if you're the kind of a child that absorbs it uh, and feels it very keenly. They just call me stupid, stupider. And, Why? Uh, I don't know. And it wasn't done with malice. No. no malice at all. I'm sure if they thought it would hurt me, they wouldn't re have repeated it. <laughs> but we all had nicknames. Uh -huh. Then I had a sister, Maddie, whom I love very dearly, that she's very, she was very beautiful and very intelligent, very quick to learn, mm -hmm. so that um, preference was given to her all the time about uh, if there was illness in the family, who should stay home would be, be Carmen. She wouldn't lose much, but Maddie would lose a great deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we were, did you know that part of uh, my, my life? No. Uh, we were sent to um, a, a Catholic uh, school on the grounds of the Catholic Academy, Sacred Heart Academy. Mm -hmm. Not where the rich girls went to the academy, no. but there was sort of a little school. Uh -huh. And one of the sisters took a liking to, they had us gather all the poor children in our neighborhood, the Italian children in our neighborhood, and we were given lessons. I sat in that schoolroom for five years, the same seat, looking out at the most beautiful garden as I ever <laughs> saw. And every time mother had a baby, had labor pains or something, Carmen stayed home. 
every Wednesday when uh, the washing was done, the landlady, the wash lady would come to wash the clothes, I'd turn the ringer. So I missed school a lot and I uh -huh. lost interest. I couldn't sure. follow. Yeah. And on top of that, I, I incurred the wrath of the sister. Why? Because I used to ask too many questions. Um, oh, the Catholic questions. Uh, first time she asked me, I had never had catechism. She said, who made you? And I said, mother. Well, I <laughs> mother was having babies every year. so <laughs> You I knew where you came that. from, I didn't, didn't you? <laughs> and she thought I was facetious and oh, got goodness. angry at me. My goodness. And it could be cruel, you know, very cruel. Heard. And uh, she took a dislike to me and took an intense love for my older sister, which could have caused a rift between us, you know, could have, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but I didn't, because yeah. Margie, uh, Ma uh, Maddie always softened the blow that the sister gave me. Well, to make a long story short, one time we were having a spelling bee, and uh, I got at the head of the class, there were two opposites. Mm -hmm. The boy was opposite me. He was, she wasn't giving him easy ones. She gave me hard ones. And finally, when she saw that she couldn't get me down, she said, stop making eyes at Sam. Sure, I was making eyes at <laughs> Sam, but not amorously. Yeah. <laughs> I was so hoping, I hope, it, I hope he misses, I hope he misses, I hope he misses. Well, I, I felt so embarrassed and mm -hmm. I felt so very then I went back crying to my seat. I didn't stay. At noon, I took my tribe of brothers and sisters and went home. <laughs> well, in those days, if you had a little bit of property, the you had to buy, buy your own school books. You know, uh -huh. We did have a little home that Dad had bought. Well, couldn't afford to buy books. As no. you got older, the books cost more. He said, you'll have to go back to the Sacred Heart. I said, I'm not. I'm not going back to Sacred Heart. He said, well, in that case, the, the others would go to, uh, they were small, you know, mm -hmm. go to a public school and you stay home. Mm -hmm. So for two years, I stayed home from 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. On my 14th birthday, I was ready to go to work and they put me in a clothing factory. Mm -hmm. Will you say they put you in a clothing factory? Well, That's what your parents mm -hmm. That was that all there was to do. I had no place else to go. That's I tried, what I mean. There was no I place tried, else. I tried. I tried to get into the the stores, retail stores. Mm -hmm. I wrote them a letter. I wrote kind of a fresh letter, something that would attract their attention. I knew <laughs> if I wrote a trite letter, it would throw, yeah. throw. and um, they called me up. They were interested. They wanted to offer me a job. 25 cents an hour. So if I said, 25 cents an hour, I said, I'd rather go into a clothing factory. And that's where I went. But I don't know that I improved it. How they, much was that? Well, I knew there were chances of making more money uh -huh. in the clothing. Uh, started at $3 a week and uh, for 48 hours and a week. And then they put, I, I insisted I put it on piecework because I was fast. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could make a lot more money. So the first week they put me on piecework, I think I made $15. Instead of three. It's better than three. That's a lot better. Yeah. And then we, um, the custom was that we turn over our pay envelope to my father every week. Mm -hmm. he, that's, uh, that was the only way we could keep the family together. Well, Nobody begrudged it. No. And uh, we were able to maintain a decent home. Now, you know, luckily we didn't come into New York City. Otherwise, we'd have been in the Italian ghetto, you know, right. which is living one on top of the other and everything else. But I do the, remember the very first home, and I got to send your husband that verse uh, that we moved into was Arch Place, and it was a dead end street, and it led to the uh, railroad tracks. Oh. And our house was right flush with the railroad. When it thundered by, it shook, you know, like a leaf because I was made out of wood. But I loved it. I used to wait for that to those thundering. 
uh, uh, heard and the blowing of the whistles and everything and wave at the people and what have you. And it's when I hear that eerie, well, you don't hear it now, you used to hear the eerie sound of the whistle okay. going in the distance. I always wanted to go where it was going, always. But what fascinated me was the, um, we used to call it the golden lo lo loge, a loge in Italian, I don't know. And uh, that was uh, the end of the car. Inevitably, there used to be a black man in a white coat <laughs> who always polished that brass, but to us it was gold. And, and it sh sh shined, it was beautiful. And I'd say, someday I'm going to sit on there. I'm going to go and go and go, and I'm going to sit out there. And you know, the day came, and I really did, accidentally. Yeah. I don't remember where I was going, to the coast or somewhere. You you did quite a lot of travel. Yes. Well, that brings me to my next question, because you said someday you were going to ride on that train. So as a child, did you dream about, did you have an ambition about what you wanted to do? Or no, not what I wanted like to do, but that I wanted to move. You did want and to leave. I wanted to move and do things, be uh -huh. somebody. I yeah. wanted to be somebody. I didn't want to be just a, a machine operator in a factory, you know? Yeah. Although I, I was complimented, and really it was a compliment to take me out of the factory and put me in Chapman's office mm -hmm. for five years. But there I, there I got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a step up, and that was part of your yeah, ambition. Because sure. then I was earning $36 a week. There was I, a lot of money for You were rich. For that, too, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me a little bit more about your parents. What kind of people were they? Well, my parents were both literate. Thank mm -hmm. goodness, as far as reading and writing and Italian. Mm -hmm. They read the Italian paper. And if you read enough of the Italian, some of the American words almost correspond, right. you know? Right. So that Mama would read the American paper as well, you know? Mm -hmm. She'd make, make it out somehow. But we were merciless when they were trying, well, Dad didn't kill, Dad went out. And, he made his way in the world. He's a very handsome man, red-headed, um, had a crew cut. He was freckled. He was very fair. He uh, found his way in the world. Mm -hmm. he, he always would know where to go and what to do. But Mother never left the house. She didn't even go to the carnage the grocery store. She was shy, mm -hmm. very shy. and. Uh, she, but she used to read a lot. In fact, she, we used to gather around the kitchen stove and she'd read us stories. Mm -hmm. I would say well, they were wonderful people and we weren't surrounded by uh, ragged people or people, ignorant people, you mm -hmm. know. It was sort of a better, we were the first Italians, by the way, to move in that neighborhood, much yeah. to the consternation of the, of the people. When they heard Italians, oh, if they were ready to move, and like they do now about the Negroes. Right. But we were cleaner than some of the others. We sure were. Dad used to, after we did the cleaning, he'd go with his white glove to see if we cleaned it well. Uh -huh. so. And um, we were finally accepted. The Alexander family accepted us. They were the ones that brought us to the school, mm -hmm. uh, to the academy. Not to the academy, to the it used to be for white to poor children, and then they gave it up and made it for poor uh, Italian children. How long did your mother live? My mother lived to, my father died first. My mother died about eight or nine years later. They lived to ripe old age in their 80s or 90s. After having 14 children, yeah, she lived mother, that long. Mothers, the doctor couldn't get over that <laughs> mother was uh, so well, you know. That's amazing. I think there's a picture of them. Yeah. Get to them. Okay. Yeah. Freedom. Yes, that was our backyard. Uh huh. Well, they're very handsome people. And this was uh, mother in her later years. Uh huh. They say I look when I look like her as I get old. Uh huh. Those eyes again. 
It seems to run in the family. Well, we all did. I, I remember a poet that used to come to the Rochester Joint Board, and he couldn't get over my eyes. He'd always remark about it because uh -huh. they were big and brown. Right. Well, they're very handsome people. It's a very good photograph. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's so much for my family. Well, for I your think. parents and everything. And, you tell them and they that. believed in education. They did want the children to go. Right. The last few, Nellie majored in music at the Eastman School of Music. Uh -huh. And Kanye became a nurse uh -huh. with a degree. The boys, well, one of them, the, young, the youngest one, he's gone into the antique business with his wife. And they do love antique because he, he took part of the trade that Dad used to like was the, uh, what did I say he was? Mm, cabinet maker. Cabinet, yeah. And uh, he can finish wood. I'll show you some of the uh, antiques Mar Margie bought from him, the beautiful uh, yeah. wood. And that's your brother? That's my brother, uh -huh. one of my brothers. Well, I remember reading that after you married, you never went back home for a long, long time. Why? Is that true? I mean, well, I didn't go back because, first of all, I kept moving. Uh -huh. I married, I guess, well, my people weren't too. I married a, a man who had been married before. So that was the problem? That was the problem. Uh -huh. And uh, secondly, is that uh, he fell very ill and I fell very ill. The first seven years of our married life, we were. And relief. It was during the depression. Right, I remember. And uh, we didn't have a chance to go back. Then I was transferred when I could get to work. I was transferred to San Francisco, to uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and that was the kind of weather the doctors had ordered for my husband. So, of course, naturally, what we kept up, correspond. Day, my father and mother never reproved me. They said when we broke up, then they said, We knew this would happen, but we wanted you to find out for yourself so that he wasn't the man for us. But actually, the man was all right. He, he, he loved women, he liked women, but uh, that's, that's a trait all men have. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, he, uh, he wasn't mean and he didn't, and he, he didn't mind working, only it was, he had a, a very severe illness. He had a tubercular kidney. Oh, In those nice. days, they didn't know how to cure it. No. They'd, they'd clean it out and put it back, clean it out and put it back, clean it out. This went on for seven years. By the time he got through, when you get well, start getting well to to go out. The depression was on in full swing. Mm -hmm. And uh, jobs were just impossible to find. Mm -hmm. And I've never, to this day, I always cry when I think of it. Uh, the day that he wanted to earn at least to bring back 10 cents so he could buy me an ice cream cone because I was, I was pregnant, the last stages of pregnancy. And I wanted an ice cream so, cone so badly, and I, he couldn't afford it. My goal. He got himself uh, a dozen can openers. He was going to go out and sell. Mm. I never saw a man broken like yeah. he was when he came home. He started to cry. I can understand why. And. Well, anyway, this went on for some time. He, he was a good man. It was just the t was econ it? economic conditions. Was everybody. And then on top of that, when we got to California, I always used my maiden name. Mm -hmm. I never used my marriage name after I got married. I know. I never and, saw uh, it. The name was, his name was Kowski, you know. It was always hard for people to pronounce, and Carmen Lu Lucia was... Easy was euphonious, and I was fond of it. Right. <laughs> and uh, they used to call him Mr. Lucia, or, oh. or Carmen's husband. Oh. That's enough to, 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 to get 
demoralize a name. I, I, I used certainly... to feel it, you know, yeah. I, I understood. And when I became very active in organizing the clerks in the department store in 1936, when I first went to California, I, was, I had already finished with the milliners. I had wonderful luck with them. That didn't mean I didn't have a fight but, <laughs> uh, with them, but we got them. I had time on my hands, and people would come and ask me if I could help them. So the, do you know that story of the department store? Mm -hmm. The retail workers? Yeah, well then I won't repeat it. So I thought the best thing to do is get him to be active after we organize it. They want to give me something, I know. I told him I didn't want any money. I said, well, instead of giving me a present, why don't you give my husband a job? Because that's what he used to do for the amalgamate. Wow. And he was there ever since. Ever since two years then, in 1936, to just quit it two years ago. So he stayed in um, San Francisco? Exactly, San Francisco. And he was, what did he do? He was an organizer for the retail No, clubs? no, no, no. He never was an organizer. He was an administrator. Oh, he was like a CPA. Right. He didn't have the CPA initial, but he did all the work. Yeah, that's what he yeah. was. Oh, well, that's very interesting. So he's been out there all these years. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, influences in your life. What <clears throat> kind of people made an impression on you well, as a young adult? The, the impression that made the most on me while I was growing up, I had a complex. I had an inferi inferiority complex. You very had bad. an inferiority yes, complex? Yes, I did. <laughs> I, I used to fight like hell, but then I still had an... Uh, <laughs> That's an very that, socially. That surprises me. An inferiority complex. In the first place, I had acne, which is enough to, to you know, uh -huh. to discourage young people. Uh, secondly, I always had the feeling I don't know as much as as, as other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started being active in the industrial department of the y YMCA. Mm -hmm. YWCA. There was a, a woman there, just like an angel to me she was. Her name was Elizabeth Hiss. And she used to bring the best, that was, she used to recognize qualities in people mm -hmm. almost in, instinctively. That was what she, I guess that was her calling. I, I don't know so. what it was. And she, she knew or she felt that there was something in me that should be brought out, and she helped me to bring it out. I became a little more articulate each time. And I always teased her years later, you shouldn't have made me so articulate. <laughs> I can't stop now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she put me up against university girls. We used to have symposiums. The university oh. girls would come and we'd argue. Uh -huh. and it was philanthropy justifiable, and, and I'd always take the ne negative <laughs> so point of view. You were a And uh, uh, she saw that I was growing, you know. And when the she heard about Bryn Mawr, she urged me to go, you uh -huh. know. And she made it possible to. I learned more about the union too there. Sure. I mean the philosophy of the uh -huh. union. I learned it more through her than I actually did while I was in the amalgamated tunes. Oh, I knew some of the fundamentals, but mm -hmm. the idealistic philosophy, she taught it to me, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, then she went to China. She was, I still have her letters from China. And they had the open door policy, mm -hmm. you know. And what did she do in China? Well, she was like a missionary teaching. Hmm. Uh, I guess she was an, an educator. Hmm. Or I, I hardly would say she was uh, teaching religion. I don't think so. I think it was teaching education of some kind hmm. or another. Because she never talked religion to us. Not to emphasize, using that as an emphasis to get us interested in other things. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, 
she stayed there for a while and then I lost track of her. I tried to find her. She got married and I tried to find her out in Baltimore. She moved, but I couldn't. I couldn't find her anymore. So I've been lucky that I've had people that believed in me that drew out whatever mater latent material was in me. And uh, then gradually, of course, um, I got active in all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There's so many things to get active, so much to do, you mm -hmm. know. Of course, I had difficulty in getting out of home um, at night. You know, I had to be home at a certain hour, mm -hmm. so it didn't make it very pleasant. I was active in the union, too. And that's how I happened to get the job in the amalgamated, you know, because I said something some night that appealed to the to the people who were fighting the administration. I happened to agree with them. <laughs> and they, that was Chapman's group. Oh, yeah. And they thought she would like that girl. Who is she? Let her come into the office. You know? mm. Of course, I gave them plen plenty of trouble after I got in. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that's that. And as far as my people are concerned, they were wonderful people. They, they still are, of course they did. But my sisters are keeping up the tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a niece that's a protester and everything under the sun. Oh, really? <laughs> In Rochester, New York. <laughs> my sister's a girl. She protests uh, all the time. What? She's on radio right now in Rochester. Hmm. Would it, is she with a certain organization? No, I think she just she's a teacher. Uh huh. And they're very careful who they what they join in. Uh -huh. There's still Actually. ostracism about oh, a lot sure. of things. You know? And now with the growth of the uh, of um, actually we're going backwards the country as as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the liberals are becoming more cautious about doing anything. Uh, the uh, ones that, uh, that used to be America first people, you know, mm -hmm. the slogan that they had during the war, America first, which yes. was all right during the war. I could understand that, of course. I have emerged again and uh, the lack of sympathy for Israel, although I wasn't Israel in it. Mm -hmm. Although some of it, I think, began, began could uh, make it some, I don't know, maybe I'm, I shouldn't say that, I don't know it well enough, some degree of trying to get together rather than having it destroyed, because they're going to destroy Israel if they, mm -hmm. it would break my heart to see it happen. I was active in that too, mm -hmm. in Atlanta, I was active. When uh, the Joseph Schlossberg, who used to be with the Amalgamated, he came to try to see if the labor movement would be interested. That was before Israel became a state. Mm -hmm. And he said, isn't there anyone that would start it or, you know, could start it? He said, well, I'll help. I used to be with the Amalgamated. I said, uh, so I'll try to get a few people together for luncheon. Mm -hmm. So I got a few people for luncheon, some very good key people, and uh, they showed films from Israel, and uh, we began to form a committee, a committee for the, the State of Israel, mm -hmm. the birth of the State of Israel. So I was secretary of that. What was it called? Mm -hmm. Was that the name of the committee? Did it? I, I, I should. That's okay. <laughs> I should remember, but I don't remember. I got a thank you letter from them when I introduced one of their speakers from Israel. They invited me because they wanted to have a Gentile person mm -hmm. to introduce uh, someone that came from Israel. I'll find it. That's okay. So, um, What, was, what were we talking about? Oh, we were I, talking I, about influences in your life. Oh, influences and... in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were too many after that. Sort of got on my feet. But Elizabeth, yes, was uh, the most one, uh, the one that helped me the most. Mm -hmm. And of course, then when I went to Bryn Mawr, 
um, Hilda Jane Smith, bless her heart, she took a liking to me. And uh, she write, She wrote me a letter. She, Quite a lady. She a lady. And uh, what an ideal person. And she, you, I showed the letter that she wrote to to Mrs. Seymour, who was, she's the one, one of the wealthy women that was interested in education for workers. You know, mm-hmm. and she, they used to raise the money. It cost two hundred dollars scholarship. You know, oh, to send us yeah. to uh, to. Brynmar, and uh, she still writes, and of course we're all trying to help her financially, you know, because she needs it, she, she gave everything that she had in life to, to, to keep the educational movement amongst the workers mm-hmm. going, you know. You read about how many schools. I got pamphlets and Another, things for you. Exactly. I got those things for you mm-hmm. from Red Mark. And she was interested. Well, she then she got in with government on the on the uh, uh, humanity questions, you know, the humanities, and she uh, OPA and OPA, whatever. I don't even remember the the. Uh, the different letters that stood for, but I got a lot of communications from her that I'd be glad to loan to you. Okay. If you, how in the world would you carry all that stuff back? <laughs> <laughs> Is your husband going to drive? Yeah. He's well, got if he drives, then you, we can I'll loan you a lot of things. Okay, and I'll call him. And you can, you can, you can have your. Then I course I got to, uh, pictures about it. But let's go back to. Uh, Smith. Smith tried then to to uh, reach as many workers as possible. She saw that there was a crying need for education. There, see the the uh, uh, the the immigration was so great coming in, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of them were educated in whatever country they came from, but they no. had to didn't know the English language. So we had people in these schools that sometimes they understood, mm-hmm. but uh, they couldn't contribute as much. And she was very, very, very patient with bringing out what material, what contribution they could make. So they'd bring think the stories that happened in their particular countries, their way of living and what it costs and the poverty. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing. What, what attracts a person like me, for instance, to get into the field. Why should, I wasn't particularly poor, we weren't rich, mm-hmm. but we had a lot of relatives and we <laughs> ought to care of one another. But uh, poverty struck me as something that has to be eradicated from when I was a child. Right. And uh, I couldn't, and the, the abuse of children I could never stand. If anything would kill me, it was abuse of children. You saw a lot of that. And I saw a lot of that. Now, the reason why I don't mention the black people so much is because in Bryn Mawr, when we had first had our few colored people, there was a lot of, um, you know, now it's going to, the, the niggers are going to start coming in, you know? Yeah. But uh, they did it so well, little by little, to get us acquainted with uh, uh, the black people. Mm-hmm. And then who was going to, we used to share rooms, and who was going to sleep with them, and who, who was going to, who was going to, who wants to sleep with the, who, the nigger, I would say. Well, I don't know, she mentioned in that letter that went to Mrs. Wetmore, and Wetmore that I had some prejudice still, but I, I can't place what kind of prejudice. They were not against colored people, because they weren't. So my first inkling of black people was in Pretty Georgia. Nice. Oh. was in Georgia. Right. I never knew about it much. We never saw them. I no. hardly ever saw them. And uh, I didn't have them at first on the picket line. There were none in the millinery factory. But uh, one night, and I did have a colored, uh, a black woman come in and stay overnight with Margie. She was a little girl, only seven years old. 
and we heard a lot of commotion at about two o'clock in the morning. And I saw a policeman beating, looking, looking out of the window, beating a, a black boy with the chains that he took from the keep off the grass, you know, these heavy chains, he was beating them. I started a scream by the murder from the window. <laughs> you leave him alone, leave him alone. If he did something wrong, arrest him. I woke up the whole neighborhood, all of the people's <laughs> in the apartment houses, you know, on West Beach Street. Oh my goodness. It was beautiful then. And uh, she, the, the woman was trembling, the maid that was with us was trembling. Don't do that, Miss Lucia. She says, if they know who you are, they're going to hold it against you. Don't say anything, leave them alone. I said, I'm not going to let them kill that boy. So I went downstairs in my robe, and who do you suppose was the policeman? Policeman, there was a head of our picket line. <clears throat> oh, no. Oh, oh, I thought, boy, am I going to get it. And I said, I changed my tune a little bit. You know, officer, if he did something wrong. I said, I know the boy. I don't know the boy, but I know he's the butler boy next door. This was a very wealthy neighborhood yeah, at that time. And, uh, oh, well, everybody came out. And what's going on? So they called the black, why don't you call the black Mariah and, and put him in, put him away, you know. He says, aren't you from the picket line? I said, yes, sir, I am. I thought, quietly, I would have said, what's your, none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't see him the next day, but he didn't ta ever talk to me again, which pleased me all right. He didn't, he didn't bother me. But. That boy nearly was killed because it was 2 o'clock in the morning it was a suspicious time for him to be around. He had gone out for a good time, so he was getting And that's home. when they were beating him up, because huh? he was just out on the street. Yeah, because he was out in the street at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> then I noticed that um, every, well, my maid would get drunk. I had a black maid that got drunk every Saturday night. She and her husband would have a fight. She was an Amazon of a woman, Willie. And I'd have to go and bail. She'd call me, come and bail me out. Well, I'd have to go and bail her out. And the next morning, or Monday morning, I'd go to their trial. All these colored people were brought in at one time no one was asked what had happened or who it was guilty or nothing. Just one judge seeing all these people and finding them right away quick. Well, no, no trial. No all. trial, nothing. Yeah. So I began to think I there's work to be done here, you know. Yes, black definitely. people. A lot of black people. But they weren't in our trade. Yeah. So then I became interested in organizing the hotel and restaurant people. There, there were black people. So the American Federation of Labor asked me to go in and help. And uh, I brought them all into the uh, labor temple. <laughs> well, they, they didn't want them in the labor no. temple. They didn't have them. And uh, they used to go and drink out of the fountains. White fountains. Well, there were no other fountains out of the town. They'd go into the ladies' room. So they called me in. They said, we can't have it. I said, you want to organize them, don't you? If you don't want them in here, then build a special one for them. But in the meantime, I was the chairman of the organizing committee. In the meantime, I said, I'm going to bring them in here. So there was that kind of a fuss. And when the picket line took place, I was told to keep the white people on one side and the black people on the other side, not to mix the pickets. Good grief. Well, you know what happened? The, the black people used to have their instruments and they'd dance and they'd sing. And then the, the other line was so dull, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they just <laughs> gradually merged yeah. and so forth. But my work with the black people was later in life. Uh, I didn't have so many. We didn't have any in our trade either until they began to work on government work. Mm -hmm. When we began to get government work during the war, they, they had to uh, 
hire right. a black people. And then it was my job to see that they worked harmoniously together. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you one thing about Georgia. <clears throat> they grew very fond of me. I didn't go there as a crusader. I went there more as like the, I tried to follow Elizabeth Hiss's way of working. Get them to like you, get them to know you, and get them to believe in you, mm-hmm. and then, you know, you could work with it. That was her philosophy. And it worked. It worked wonders. Because most of the damn, the damn Yankees, that's what I used to call them, too. <laughs> now, I used to call them, you know, most of the damn Yankees. Uh, they came down. Uh, used to want to do, overnight they wanted to, to make a change. Well, you can't do that. Yeah. And, it made it harder for the black people sure. when they came down there sometime with that kind of a philosophy. Well, then, wages, conditions. I think that's the most important thing to talk about. The reason why we organized uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, well, we, work had been going on trying to organize, but it was very difficult difficult because the fear of organization of losing their jobs was uppermost even though there was a Wagner Act you yeah. know, that you have a right to belong to a union of your own choosing mm-hmm. blah 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 but uh, <laughs> you know, they could also fire you and take two years to get you back if you ever ever got back and uh, there was a hearing our president Max Zaritsky and I love that man. He was an ideal person, always a wonderful person. And uh, he uh, went before the committee and thought that uh, the milliners were entitled to at least 40 cents an hour. It used to be 25, you know, 25 cents an hour. When he recommended 40 cents, and I think, um, who was there from? man from riches, I forgot his name, there was someone, not Mr. Rich himself, but somebody else, i have forgotten his name, he agreed with him, but uh, it, it, we had someone on his side from yeah. management, and it came out in the newspapers, and the gr- people who worked in the millinery shops read that the bosses thought that no southern worker is worth 40 cents an hour. That was what one of them said. Okay. It came out in the paper. Uh-huh. So that one, that one shop, the employer that one shop, they came out en, en masse. Mm-hmm. They didn't even wait for us to, to, <laughs> to call them out. They came out. And uh, the third, the second one was run by a Jewish man who um, I was afraid of uh, being Jewish in the South. There was mm-hmm. tremendous anti-Semitism at the time. And there had been that Frank case, wasn't it? Leo, Leo Frank. Leo Frank case. He didn't want any repetition of Leo Frank. He closed his plant entirely for the time being rather than try to run the scabs, mm-hmm. which of course helped. The one that fought us bitterly was the American Hat Company. Mr. Mm-hmm. Thompson was his name. He fought us tooth and nail for nine solid months. Mm -hmm. And he said the only reason he signed was he couldn't stand the singing. I used to always have the the girls sing Union song. And the songs, every time they'd see him, Oh, man, Thompson ain't what he used to be. Ain't (laughs) what he used to follow him all around singing the song. He finally signed. And we had Hartsfield, that really was uh, Mayor Hartsfield. Right. He really was sympathetic. Although I remember one time he called me in the office, he wanted to get to know me. He said, I heard there was a Yankee down here and was creating a little trouble. So, of course, I spoke very kindly to him and told him what my mission was. He said, um, i tell you one thing. If the time ever comes when uh, the Negroes begin to get recognition, I'm going to take down that American flag 
looking up at the capital or whatever it was and stomp on it. Yeah. Do you know that he was the first mayor that had black policemen? Uh-huh. Who changed so? Did. Yes. And he was crazy about our president. And he liked me. He did, it turned out that he did like me. So I had a long time in Atlanta, Georgia. I was on every single committee. I was uh, chairman of the organizing committee for the Aperbells, the council. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then when the Dixie operation, Operation Dixie mm -hmm. started, you heard about right. Operation Dixie? Mm -hmm. I was on the national board of Operation Dixie. So what else could I tell you about Atlanta? I love I love the place. I really love it. We're sorry you left. Huh? We're sorry you left. We need people like you. I am glad I wish I could go back. Well, I uh, hope you have an opportunity to someday. And then uh, Mrs. Lindsay, I think that was her name. She was a, she was from Saint Mark's Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. I I did go to Saint Mark's Methodist Church. I was a member. Um, she wanted me to talk to her group in Lake Julaska, J-U-N, Junalaska, Junalaska, Lake Junalaska. It was a Methodist uh, Yeah, it's a place. camp or something yeah. like that, I'm not sure. And when I got there, I thought, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> What's labor got to do with religion? I spoke last, good thing. I took everything that they said and aligned it with the, our philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, chasing of the money, uh, money changes out of the temple by Christ. And, and then we have songs, we are climbing Jacob's ladder, you know, <laughs> we're climbing the union's ladder or something. Yeah. And, 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 oh, I had all kinds of things that were relative, you know. So I, I enjoyed that. It was a beautiful place, Lake yeah. Chumlaska. I don't know where it is. I'm not sure. I think it's Lake out. Lake June, Alaska. It has a great big cross that you mm -hmm. could see for miles and miles mm -hmm. around. I forgot where it was. And she was on the President's Committee for uh, Human Rights. And she gave me her of the book with her signature on it. We became very good friends. I can't think of anything else in so far as Atlanta. So well, let's go back. Let's let's backtrack, okay? Mm -hmm. um, at Bryn Mawr, when you were there for the summer school for women workers, you were president of the class in 1930. Yeah. The second time you were there. Yeah. And uh, was it an honorary position, or were there special tasks assigned to you as president of the class? Well, for one thing, we had a regular election, you know, mm -hmm. selection by vote, and uh, I was chosen. I was, cho I was elected for two things that time, uh, for the president of the summer class of 1930, but also to be on the affiliated board for schools, mm -hmm. which was a national organization. <laughs> and uh, my job was to uh, keep the girls happy and alive and interested, find out whether they'd like to, they were learning enough, they got enough out of it, and to make recommendations to the teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some of them preferred other things to what they were being taught. So that was all, I was sort of a, a buffer between the, the, the uh, students and the faculty. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so then we talked about how it should be extended, that there were people, it should be widened, mm -hmm. or more Negroes, mm -hmm. you know, even we got yeah. the girls to make that recommendation. After all, 90% of them that came from the industry were Jewish, right. and uh, naturally they had had an, enough uh, uh, things done to them that made them conscious of the difficulty the Negroes uh, were having. So they helped a great deal in making the school more, uh, well, more typical of what America should be. Mm -hmm. 
I think that was my function. Then, unfortunately, I married and, and uh, oh, I went to work for the necktie workers because mm -hmm. the, the girl that uh, I, I roomed with in Goodenau, she said, they're looking for organizers in our union. Why don't you come over? So I just see Louis Fuchs, isn't he? F-U-C-H-S. Yeah. <coughs> he he hired me, <coughs> and uh, sent me to uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Right. You got the history of that. Yeah, one, yeah. I thought that was interesting that uh, one of your first organizational strikes was in New Haven, Connecticut, and here you are only 30 miles away <laughs> from New Haven. How do you feel about that? I haven't been there yet. You haven't I been to New Haven? Haven. Been, no. Well, you know, I've been sick and still <laughs> not well. You'll have to go back if no, you yeah, get a chance. But they say that, well, what I did was I looked, I met one of the nurses, the visiting nurses, she's a lovely person, mm -hmm. I wish you could be here. Uh, uh, Joanne, she just married recently, and I was the only one of the sick people that she takes care of that she invited me. Oh, in. how wonderful! And she married a lovely man too, and they're going to Yukon. When they first said Yukon, I thought I meant, I meant to Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> the university. She, her, her, his mother comes from New Haven, uh -huh. and I was telling her. Do you, by any chance, know if there's a Dr. Lad, Lad from the Divinity School? Oh, she's, he's dead. He's been dead for some time. Mm -hmm. I said, do you know that he helped us an awful lot in mm -hmm. 1930? She said, you know, I remember something about 1930. Wasn't there a big strike? I said, yes, there was. Very, very big strike. But we had Dr. Lad on our side and his wife. You couldn't have had a nicer person. So I, I went and looked for the picture of the staff that was there, the staff that worked with me uh -huh. in New Haven, and I found them. Oh. And I was going to send them to her to see if there's still any of them still alive. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew Rose Sullivan was, and she had died. I lost them. They had been in a drawer for 46 years, in a box in a drawer for 46 years. I took them out and I lost them. The other day I went to look for the uh, book on, uh, the, on um, my story with the uh, ar for the archives in Texas, and there they were. Oh, you had put them in there. I had put them in there. So Apparently you found them. Was, well, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you found yeah. them. Yeah, so I'm going to see if I can contact some of the people that I knew there, what what became of them, you know. That would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about um, your non-union activities. I know that everything you did was sort of tied in with your union work, but yet uh, I saw that you had, uh, you were working with various voter and worker education projects. So uh, let's talk about education first. Uh, I know that in the 1930s, like you said, you were affiliated with the, uh, you were the secretary for the Affiliated School for Workers. Um, the student representative on the faculty. You were the student representative on, on the, the faculty. faculty. Okay, yeah. well that's what I wanted to know, was what, what you did for that organization. Exactly what was the organization? What was the Affiliated School <coughs> for Workers Incorporated? Well, it was incorporated sometime in, um, let me get my friend me in my file because I took it out. Okay. Yeah. Can I help you? Okay. You even got a diploma. Right? You got a diploma. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, that was a beautiful college. Oh, it is. That's a beautiful picture. Um, these are all going to be long to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's woman workers. Bryn Mawr Center School. It's not just Bryn Mawr, then. It's uh, what it stands for and how it went in. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes we grew like mushrooms, you know. See, <clears throat> James Smith, they were a well-to-do family in the Vineyard Shore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do you call it? Martha's, Martha's, Vine- Martha's Vine- Vineyard. They had quite a bit of uh, property. They turned it over to for educational pur- purposes, and there was a school called the Vineyard Shore School. I wondered yeah, about that because yeah. I had never heard of it. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see. Course is open. This is 1927. Mm-hmm. See expenses. Admission requirements. I thought you could use this. Uh, right, that's very good. Yeah. Student summer school. We used to do a lot of her studying outdoors too, you know, it was so beautiful. Oh, Bryn Mawr is such a beautiful place. And uh, <laughs> we even learned to, something about the stars. I learned about uh, Queen Cassiopeia's chair. I've never forgotten. <laughs> Are you in any of these? <laughs> no, they were. They were posed. Yeah, this is a picture. I don't even know what that here. See if you can find me over here. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here. <laughs> well, did you do any drawing? Oh, we were drawing, yeah. They gave us a smattering of different things, you uh-huh. know? That's what I'd call it, is a smattering. Poetry even, hour, yeah. Even dissecting an animal, which I did, that was one feature I didn't care for. <laughs> you didn't like that? <laughs> no, I didn't like you that. You didn't like biology? No, I didn't. Mm-hmm. See here the, who the representative joint committee. Uh, Vassar and Smith College and all these Rose uh, Chatterman. Mm-hmm. Were you ever a member of the National Women's Trade Union League? No, you know it's funny. I never came across in all the few of my work. Isn't Rose that Schneiderman, amazing? Rose Schneiderman used to be our vice vice uh-huh. president emeritus. Huh. But I needed never, she was never in the South where I was, where I needed her very badly or needed their work very badly. No, but I knew a lot of the people that uh, used it. Mm-hmm. <coughs> <coughs> you know, if you want to, you can borrow this whole thing and okay. there's enough. Let me put it all back over here. I, don't want to... I like your diploma. That's very nice. But it reached all over to California, to the south. In fact, when I was organizing um, Winchester, Tennessee, I had one of their students, a male, Mm -hmm. and he was marvelous. The courage, terrific courage he showed, and I'm sure it was a bread mark. Uh, had a lot know, to do with it, yeah. Had a lot to do with it, bringing it out. It probably was there right along, but you know, sometimes unless you're given the opportunity to show it, you lose it. Uh-huh. Now, that's that. Um, Ella, you and so on, let's know about James Smith. Yeah, tell me what. You call her Jane. I well, know the people that love her the most call her Jane F. Smith, Hilda Worthington Smith. Right. I knew that, and I wondered where the Jane came from. And I, we, she likes to be called by, I'm one of her favorite students, I guess, and all her real friends uh, call her Jane. Mm-hmm. She wants to be called Jane, but <laughs> her real friends, maybe that one is F. Yeah. 
get what? Oh no. That's not. That was written a long time ago, wasn't it? It was published in the advance, the paper of the hatter. I mean, of the clothing yeah. workers. It's the bread lines that I used to see in New York. It used to break my heart. Didn't you stand in those lines a few times? Yes, a couple of times. To be registered more than for a handout. Mm -hmm. I remember in one take you said that the food was very old and bad and had been stored for years in the warehouses. Yeah. You've got an excellent memory. Yes, I do. <laughs> terrific memory. Helps me and get through school. <laughs> and you know so many people. <clears throat> it's all beginning to run together a little bit in my mind, mm -hmm. though, as I work more with it. Uh, I'm becoming very fond of all these people. Your poetry is very good. I like it. Mm. I had read some that I got from uh, the little magazine that Bryn Mawr Summer School did. Oh. Do you remember that? No, I didn't. They did a little mimeograph thing. Um, oh. And the archivist at Bryn Mawr sent me some copies of your poetry. Oh, and maybe you've got some of these, although some of these were written later on. No, I have just the ones that were from that yeah, The Railroad to Ecstasy. Uh-huh. And uh, there's one on the Easter Bother. The one on Hunger. This must have been written. Oh, this was in 1968. Absolutely. I think this was one of the ones in written in Grandma Patterns. Mm -hmm. I think it was. And Bread Vines. <laughs> 